Hello and welcome to Forensic Psychology Lesson 4. This video is going to cover biological explanations for crime with a focus on genetic and neural explanations. So, just so that you know what the specification says that you need to know about, so specifically you need to be able to outline and evaluate genetic and neural explanations for criminal behaviour. That means that we are going to be looking at candidate genes, and we are also going to be looking at twin and adoption studies as part of the genetic element of this lesson, and then for the neural element we are going to be looking at the role of the prefrontal cortex and the role of mirror neurons as well. So as we know, early attempts at biological explanations for criminal behaviour have been widely discredited. The link to the video on the atavistic form should be appearing on your screen now if you need to have a quick recap of that. That being said, the suggestion that criminal behaviour is in some way heritable has continued to be investigated with some success. Equally, there are also some neural differences between criminals and non-criminals that have been discovered, and it's possible that these two factors are in some way connected, that some underlying genetic abnormalities could cause structural and functional differences in the criminal brain. It doesn't have to be that way, they could also just occur individually, but it is possible that the two explanations are linked in some way. So let's start with what research into the role of genes has found. Genetic explanations for crime suggest that offenders inherit a gene or some combination of genes that predisposes them to commit crime. The importance of genes is illustrated by twin studies. For example, Carl Christiansen in 1977 studied over 3,500 twin pairs in Denmark and found a concordance rate for offender behaviour of 35% for identical twins and 13% for non-identical twins. And that data suggests that both behaviour and underlying traits that predispose people to criminal behaviour could be inherited. Additionally, Crow, in 1972, found that adopted children whose biological mother had a criminal record had a 50% chance of also having a criminal record by the age of 18, whereas adoptees without a criminal mother only had a 5% risk. Again, showing the impact of genes on offending behaviour. Moving on, a genetic analysis of almost 800 offenders in Finland, conducted by Tihonen et al. in 2014, suggests that two specific candidate genes may be associated with violent crime. The MAOA gene, which regulates serotonin and dopamine in the brain, and serotonin particularly is thought to play a role in impulsive aggression, and a second gene, the CDH13 gene, which has been linked to things like substance abuse and ADHD. The analysis found that 5-10% to of all violent crime in Finland is attributable to the MAOA and the CDH13 genotypes. Now just as a final word on the role of genes. If genes are involved in offending behaviour, it seems highly likely that those genes could be moderated by the environment. So for example, in other topics like schizophrenia, we've seen that genetic vulnerability and a psychological or biological trigger can bring about the onset of the condition. And so it's possible that offending behaviour could also be caused by the same combination. So, for example, a genetic vulnerability brought about by the MAOA genotype or the CDH13 genotype, and then equally being raised in a dysfunctional environment or with criminal role models could then trigger the onset of criminal behaviour. Okay, so the diathesis stress model is equally applicable here for offending behaviour as it is with conditions like schizophrenia. So, moving on to neural explanations. Neural explanations focus on structures in the brain that may be slightly different in offenders than they are in non-offenders. A lot of evidence in this area has involved individuals that have been diagnosed with antisocial personality disorder. 
and symptoms of APD include things like reduced emotional responses and a lack of empathy for the feelings of others. And it is also a condition that characterises a lot of convicted offenders. Rain et al. conducted many studies of APD and has reported several studies using brain imaging techniques that demonstrate that individuals with antisocial personality disorder have reduced activity in the prefrontal cortex. The prefrontal cortex is a part of the brain that regulates emotional activity. Alongside those findings, Rain and his colleagues in 2000 also found an 11% reduction in the volume of grey matter in the prefrontal cortex of people with APD compared to controls. Now, a second neural explanation for offending behaviour focuses on the role of mirror neurons. Now, mirror neurons are a particular type of neuron that are equally active when we are performing an activity or when we're watching somebody else perform that activity. They allow us to interpret and understand the intentions and emotions of other people, and therefore they allow us to experience empathy. And these mirror neurons are generally switched on by default. Okay, we can't turn off our ability to experience empathy because, you know, we just do it. Now, Kieser's et al. in 2011 found that when people with APD were asked to empathize, their empathy reactions activated, but they only activated when they were asked to do so. So that suggests that people with antisocial personality disorder can experience empathy, but they do so more sporadically and by choice. And so if we're looking at a neural difference between offenders and non-offenders, or more specifically people with APD and people without APD, then that neural difference is people without APD have their mirror neurons consistently switched on, whereas people with APD have them switched off, which shows that they are not experiencing empathy. However, they do have the ability to switch those mirror neurons on, which means that they can experience empathy, but only if they are asked to do so. Okay? Those are your genetic and your neural explanations for crime. We're now going to move on to some evaluation points. There's six in total, but that's simply because you need to be prepared for a potential essay on both genetics and or neural explanations. So you need enough evaluation points to kind of cover all of your bases. Okay, so let's have a look at what we've got. So our first evaluation point is a strength of the diathesis stress model. And this was research conducted by Mednick et al. in 1984, who did research on over 13,000 adoptees. And they found that when neither the biological nor the adoptive parent had convictions, the percentage of adoptees that did was 13.5%, which is quite high. They found that when either of the biological parents had a conviction, that rate went up to 20%, and it went up to 25% when both sets of parents had a conviction. So that shows us that inheritance does play a role, but the role of the environment can't be disregarded. Okay. Next, I have two weaknesses of adoption and twin studies. So first off, twin studies tend to assume that the twins were raised in equal environments, because the twins generally are raised together. However, that could apply much more to identical twins than it does to non-identical twins, because people, particularly parents, tend to treat identical twins much more similarly than they do non-identical twins. In a lot of cases, they're effectively treated like they're the same person, and that will impact behaviour. So, the higher concordance rates that are recorded with identical twins could be a result of them being treated the same rather than due to genetics which obviously presents itself as a confounding variable for this type of research. Also, a limitation of adoption studies is the fact that the presumed separation of genetic and environmental influences, which is kind of the whole point of adoption studies, is complicated by the fact that many children experience very late adoption, which means that much of their infancy and childhood could have been spent with their biological parents anyway. Similarly, a lot of adoptees actually maintain regular contact with their biological parents following their adoption. 
So both of those points make it very difficult to assess from adoption studies the environmental impact that the biological parents might have had because they're still having an impact either in the first couple of years of the infant's life before they get adopted or through regular contact. So that suggests that assessing the relative impact of nature and nurture may only be possible with very early adoptions where contact with the biological relatives doesn't occur because otherwise the contact with the biological relatives again is a confounding variable. Right, so moving on, I now have two evaluation points for you for neural explanations. The first one is a strength, and it is research support for the link between crime and the frontal lobe. So Candell and Freed in 1989 reviewed evidence of frontal lobe damage and antisocial behaviour, and they found that impulsive behaviour, emotional instability, and inability to learn mistakes were all linked to frontal lobe damage. So that supports the idea that brain damage may be a causal factor in offending behaviour. And a limitation is that the link between neural differences and antisocial personality disorder may be much more complex than it at first seems because other factors could contribute to APD and ultimately to offending. So, for example, Farrington et al. in 2006 studied a group of adult males who scored highly on an APD test. And these individuals experienced various risk factors during childhood, such as being raised by a convicted parent or being physically neglected. So it could be that these childhood experiences caused their antisocial personality disorder and also some of the neural differences that are associated with it, such as reduced activity in the frontal lobe due to trauma. So that suggests that the relationship between neural differences, antisocial personality disorder, and offending is very, very complex, and there might actually be other confounding variables that have an impact. Okay, and then just a final evaluation point. Um, this is an evaluation point that kind of goes for both of the topics, um, and it links to issues and debates as well, and that is the issue of biological reductionism. Now, realistically, criminality is far too complex to reduce to a genetic or a neural level, um, because a lot of things that seem to run in families, like poverty, emotional instability, social deprivation, that kind of thing. So it's very, very difficult to actually disentangle all of the possible influences on offending behaviour. Also, concordance rates in twin studies are never 100%, which means that environmental factors may be responsible, or at least partly responsible, for criminal behaviour. So for example, the diathesis stress model, like we said in the outline, could be used to explain criminal behaviour, where concordance rates for identical twins are not 100%. Okay, so biological explanations suffer from biological reductionism because they oversimplify offending behavior by reducing it down to a simple biological level. Okay, so just before we finish off then, obviously this comes up in paper three and so there is likely to be an essay on it if it comes up. Obviously it goes without saying that Technically, you can get a multiple choice question on it, a two marker, a four marker, a six marker, an eight marker, a 16 marker, anything really. But if we just assume that an essay is going to come up, it can come up in a whole load of different ways. And each one of these could technically come up as an eight marker or a 16 marker. But obviously, if they're asking you to outline and evaluate two, then it's more likely to come up as a 16 marker. So there are a lot of different outlines and a lot of different essays that you could technically get, and they're all variations of the same thing, but obviously they all kind of want a bit of a focus on different things. So you need to be prepared for anything, all right? Um, in terms of one particular essay that I'm going to focus on just to give you an outline for, it's going to be this one. Outline, technically, and evaluate genetic and neural explanations for offending behavior. So if you were going to write an outline, a six mark outline, where you wanted to get both genes and neural explanations in, then this is what I would do. So I would start off with a little bit of, of an introduction, as usual, just one sentence that says what genetic and neural explanations actually are, and what they kind of suggest about behavior. Then I would choose one to give a little bit more detail to, and one to give a little bit less detail to. So I've gone with genes as my little bit more detail, 
I've used two studies. I've got Christiansen and I've done Tihonen. The reason I've done those two is because I don't need twin studies and adoption studies. I can live with one twin studies and then a genetic analysis as well. So that's what I've done there. I've given a little bit of detail about what they did. I've definitely got the names in because that kind of adds uh, to the detail as well. Um, when it comes to my neural explanations, I have kind of gone with a little bit less detail, but I've still kind of got quite a nice amount in there. I haven't talked about mirror neurons because I don't need to. Um, one neural explanation is fine, and actually both of the evaluation points that I've given you work for the impact of the prefrontal cortex. Okay, so technically for what I'm going to write in my evaluation section, this would be the best way to go. Obviously, like I said, it depends on what the question is going to be, but if it is a generic outline for a six for six marks with this title that I've given you, then this would be a solid outline. Spend a bit of time letting all of that sink in. There's quite a lot of information and um, also there's a lot of studies and stuff in there that you need to get your head around, but that is the end of the video. So I hope it's all made sense and I hope it's been useful. Thank you very much for listening. If you have any questions, just pop them in the comment section and I will see you in the next one. Thank you.